Hey, welcome back. Today we have a interesting little part to make. This is a quick connect for a flux capacitor. Well, uh, the question came up why I'm making so many parts for the flux capacitor. The reality is um, it might be quite shocking, but flux capacitors don't exist. And I use the term flux capacitor in reference to a famous movie just for parts where I cannot disclose their real use, but the customer still allowed to show the part. So it's my MacGuffin. Um, so this, this is um, machined from stainless steel, 14301 stainless. So a little bit annoying material, but it gives very nice finishes to be honest. It's basically a straight turning and milling operation. Apart from one thing, there are these two pins on, on both sides opposing each other and they stick out of the turn surface. And th this is the crux of this part. The, the, this, this makes it complicated. All, everything else is pretty simple and straightforward turning. So let's, let's see how we tackle a part like this and how we go about it to create this unique feature. When I first looked at this part, well, I knew that I had to, to leave material in this area. In, in this area, a band of material all around where I machine those two pins out and then remove all the material in between the pins. At first I had a really wacky setup with the rotary table with the center of rotation in the position of this pin. And then I was spinning the whole part like this under a one millimeter end mill and I was rotary milling this pin. After part, I, I think, yeah, it's this one. This one was done that way, rotary milling this feature and then whittling away all the material in between with, with the same one millimeter end mill then a little bit of hand blending. Um, the pin feature looks terrible. This took relatively long. The, the one millimeter end mill is really not for hogging. Uh, it takes some sweet time to, to cut this feature on a manual machine. And the setup itself was also quite terrible. I have a picture of the rotary table with the punch grinding fixture on top. I'm using the large rotary table to do the rotary milling of the pin feature and the punch milling fixture to do my, to do this orientation to remove the material in between the pins. As I said, really a terrible setup in overall. And I went back to the drawing board and then I had the idea of making a tree panning tool. First I looked if a small commercial tree panning tool was available and there is none. Nobody tree pans apart from watchmakers uh, features that small. So I went over to the tool and cutter grinder and I created this tool here. This has a four millimeter carbide shank, it's an old end mill and this is basically a tree panning tool. It's, it's acting like a single flute hole saw, for example. It cuts a slot and while it cuts, or a, 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 a round groove, and while it cuts the groove, it creates a pin and a OD. It creates a feature like this. And I will have a video showing how I grind this tool on the tool and cutter grinder and how I came up with the geometry. Uh, that's a separate topic because it's a little bit involved. And this created this feature and this looked like a winning strategy. Great finish. The, the pin was very, very round. It's fast. The, 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 the diameter of the pin and the OD of the hole was very, very, or the ID of the hole was very precise. So really a good, a good process, very stable. Roughing out with, with a CNMG insert, this is geometry for stainless steel, running at about 1800 RPM. And I'm hand feeding because the distances are very short and 
the gearbox is set to the threading pitch that I need for the other side of the part and I don't want to run into the danger of forgetting to uh, change between power feeding and threading feed. So uh, hand feeding it is. <clears throat> okay, as you can see by the burrs here, this insert is not the best and I decided to cut it dry because I didn't want to smoke up the whole shop with cutting oil fumes. Uh, DCMT insert with a 0.4 millimeter nose radius, also geometry for stainless, for finishing stainless. Touching off on the end of the part, taking a very light skim cut on the face to, to get my zero. Taking a light pass, a pre-finishing pass here, so I can come in with my micrometer and check if my diameter on the part matches my DRO. And it doesn't because the machine was sitting overnight and uh, there is some thermal drift in the machine. So we enter this number into the DRO and now when we take cuts we will get them to dimension. So this should be 8.5, 8.506, so that's good. So we need to leave a little bit of material here, like uh, about a band of this width. It has a proper dimension, but that doesn't matter for the matter of explaining it. So I will take this DCMT finishing insert and just plunge in and cut to the right side to create the left shoulder of this undercut. Uh, reducing the RPM here to about, what's that? Uh, to about 500 RPM because this is a fairly large engagement once we plunge in there. And this is a case where we will definitely use cutting oil, otherwise it gets a little bit messy. Okay, we roughed out most material and now we plunge down to final depth according to our DRO. Clean up the, the floor of this groove and take a facing cut here on the side. Then we come back and clean up the right side where we have to taper from the taper from the DCMT insert. Uh, for that we can go back with the RPM to about 1000 RPM. And now we need to remove the taper on the right side of the groove. I will move the camera over a little bit. To clean up the groove we will take a parting insert 
This has a lead angle to the right, so it's angled like this. This does a very nice job of this procedure. So we touch off on the right side. Yeah, there is a danger of chipping the insert, but if you uh, did this long enough, you rarely crack a 30 euro insert. Well, this is a relapped and reground insert, so it's not as <laughs> painful if you break it. To be honest, that's a pretty good blend between those two surfaces. If you take a, a poker and we move it over here, there is no feelable different, uh, difference. And we as humans are pretty good at feeling height difference between surfaces if, you're, if you run your finger across. Our fingers are pretty, pretty precise measuring instruments. The almighty chamfering tool. This is just a piece of carbide split in half and ground to 45 degrees. I'm running I'm running this tool relatively slow, or the workpiece, the tool is stationary, about uh, 400 RPM. I added a little bit of blue felt marker because this makes it easier to pick up the edge on camera. There we go. Now I zero out the DRO, add some cutting oil and move in the width of the chamfer. Spotting with a pyramid spotting drill at 2000 RPM. And through drilling through the part with a 2 mm drill. Uh, the final through hole through the part will be larger than this, but I use this as a roughing tool and then the final diameter drill as a finishing tool. This removes the bulk of the material and then the, the drill for the finish size will drill on size and leave a nicer finish. And I'm drilling, as usual, with the drill chuck here in the tool post using the carriage hand wheel and since we're drilling about 20 millimeters deep that's 10 times diameter deep that's already considered deep hole drilling the carriage makes it very easy to quickly retract the tool and get very fast to our final depth uh, try that by hand cranking a tailstock Okay, and this is a 4.5 millimeter drill to hog out the majority of this uh, of this recess that we have to bore into the end of the part. Okay, that's all the drilling for the moment. Now we change to a boring bar and, and do our ID work. 
I switched to a small solid carbide boring bore, PH Horn System uh, 105, Super Mini 105. And first we will touch off on the face of the part to get our zero. And then for the first pass we just plunge in in the center to remove the majority of the drill cone at the bottom of the hole. Uh, adding a little bit of cutting oil. Uh, this used to have a needle on it. Huh. Uh, this material reacts a little bit gnarly when you try to cut it completely dry in some cases. Okay, uh, going... Uh, with these small boring bars, when you cut up to a shoulder and there is a chip stuck in front of the cutting edge, um, you will notice that it will give you some resistance on the hand wheel and you can either push the cutting edge through the chip and usually um, that will result in the tool making a little bit of a jump and damaging the, the, the wall or you retract, get the chip out and come back in. Now, this is a 5.6 millimeter pin, lower end of the diameter. This is a extremely close fit goes in. By feeling it, it's probably about 10 micron oversize. Uh, the 5.7 should not fit at all, yes. And the nominal pin, center of tolerance, doesn't also, also doesn't fit. We could leave it like that. We're already within the tolerance band of this bore. But I think it's good practice to shoot for center of tolerance. So uh, this, this pin should be a snug fit in here. So we'll take another fine cut. Um, not using the, f the balanced cut technique with these tools here. Well, you can, it's good practice, but these micro boring tools react extremely well to, to very small depth of cuts. They, if you, if you dial in 10 micron in diameter, you will get 10 micron in diameter. Okay, this is the nominal size pin. Um, ooh, okay, it wants, but it doesn't. Okay, uh, I took another 10 micron pass and this is the nominal size pin, 5.65. And uh, this is a close fit. Let's get a, let's get a 5.66 pin and check again. And the 5.66, that's 10 micron over nominal, doesn't fit. So hit the dimension pretty good. I hear you, but Stefan, you have 50 micron plus minus tolerance on this bore. And why are you shooting that precisely for a nominal size? Well, the answer is simple. Um, good practice for me. Each time I shoot for a precise dimension like this, it's a little bit of training and I just get in the habit of working precisely. And it is good practice. I'm, that, that's the reason why I'm pretty okay on the lathe at hitting dimensions and having little trouble hitting dimensions because I do it all the time even if it's not 
100% necessary. 2.6mm drill bit. This is to open up the 2mm screw hole to, to final dimension and leaving a good finish. Running at a thousand RPM. And, and now for the last tool, a center drill. I'm holding this in a split collar in a regular tool holder because for this application I want a very stiff tool. I'm dropping the tool in until the angle of the, the 60 degree cone hits the screw hole like this. I will hit it there, zero out the DRO and then, and then I will cut with the center drill to my final depth. A little addition to the 60 degree feature that we did here on the inside. Uh, we started by drilling on the size and then two size. This is the final diameter of the screw hole. Then I took my my 60 degree center, center drill and I came in here until the edge of the or the, the cone of this uh, center drill touched this edge here. Uh, I zeroed out the DRO in this position, repeated it, checked if it's repeatable or if there is anything um, weird happening, but it, it repeated within 10 microns when I did this. And zeroed out the DRO and then I used my calculated depth, the correct one, to, to cut in to my final depth. like this. Then I got the tool out of course and we had this feature and with this depth here and with this depth here from here to here the resulting diameter here is diameter 4 as it should be per drawing. So that's the way this worked. Okay, last tool is a chamfer tool to bring in to chamfer the ID and the OD of the part. Okay, now we can take this part over to a milling machine. Time to do some milling. Do die, do die. Hope I get away with it, do die. So we're over at the Decal FP1. I have the indexing head tilted to 90 degrees. So the spindle is horizontal, it's trammed in. Uh, holding the part in a, in a collet. And since collets are not perfect and we want to do a nice job of blending the surfaces together, I'm indicating the part. I'm putting an indicator here and I'm just spinning the, the part by hand and looking at my run out and I get about, well that's, that's pretty decent, that's 40 micron run out, that's a lot. So uh, there is a trick, you just take the part, since we are clamping on an unmachined diameter and indicating on the machined diameter we can just just spin the part and play with the run out that way okay got verse okay now it's going it's getting better i'm just tightening and losing the collet and spinning the part a little bit 
until I get a decent run out. I'm shooting for about 20 micron or better if possible. Yeah, that's 20. Let's see if it gets better or worse if I continue. Okay, that's, let's tighten the collar properly. Check the run out again. It's 10 and a little bit. So that's fine, that, that blend will be nice. Okay, since the runout is sorted out, next thing is to use a edge finder. This is just a regular edge finder to find the end of the part. Running it at a thousand RPM. I'm using the hydraulic chuck here for all the operations. Hydraulic chucks are nice. They have a hex here that pushes on an oil reservoir and these are double walled. They have a very thin inner wall with the bore for the tool and the thick outer shell. And if you compress the oil with the set screw up here, the tool gets clamped because the, the oil bladder compresses the bore. And this is a very fast way to change tools and highly precise. Uh, they come in nominal sizes like uh, 6, 8, 12, 20 and 25 millimeters I think are usual diameters. And you can sleeve them down with, with these straight shank and straight bore sleeves. These are not collets, they are just sleeves to reduce the diameter. And I find this hydraulic chuck to be an excellent way uh, as a, a an excellent quick change tooling system. I can change between a sleeve with the edge finder now to a sleeve with the small tree panning tool that we need very fast. Just tighten it down a few spins with the hex key and you're good to go. And the run out on these hydraulic chucks is in general better than most collets. And they are very stiff and also they're dampening the way they dampen vibrations when you do roughing with them is astonishing. Uh, I really like this. They are expensive. It's about 250 bucks. Uh, they show up used and you can have them refurbished if you buy a used one from, from the place you they, that manufactured them. And and overall, they are just a nice system. They have an extremely limited uh, clamping range. They can, for example, only use, if you have a six millimeter hydraulic chuck, it will only clamp six millimeter minus a few microns. So there is a need for fairly precise tool shank diameters with these chucks. Okay, we have the tree panning tool here. I'm moving over 3.5 millimeters. Use a little bit of a blue felt marker up here so I can touch off properly. Okay, first side done. Now we index 180 degrees. Click, lock it and do the same on this side.
Okay, that's the two pin features that we cut. Um, this the three panning tool is truly like cheating, as a, as a good friend of mine call, called them. Uh, this really works darn good. Now we change to a ball end mill and we will mill away, rotary mill away this band of material here. Got a 1.5 millimeter two fluid carbide ball end mill in here. First thing is to touch off on C height. I blew up the part so I see my, my touch off mark very nicely. We try to hit the, the, the height as precisely as possible. I'm also going to use a magnifier here to, to watch the tool approach the work. Then we're going to step over and then we're rotating the work into the end mill. Step over 0.25 millimeters, uh, rotate back, forth, back, forth until it's all cleaned away. We're basically four axis rotary milling on a manual mill, uh, 3D milling basically. Uh, we will get a little bit of a step over of course from the ball end mill because it doesn't have a flat end, uh, but we will talk about that too. Okay, let's wash off the cutting oil. This is just isopropane alcohol. And now you can see, there's a tiny, tiny ripple to the surface. Um, but that's about, I think about six micron height on these cusps. Uh, I will do a sketch later how that looks. Uh, so that, that went fairly quick looking at the time code here on the camera. It was about four minutes to remove all this material with this tiny end mill. Keep in mind we're just running 2000 RPM. We're not high speed machining here. Well, that's to the back side. I already have my C height now, after doing the first side, so it's very easy to do the second side too. The next feature that we cut requires a carbide end mill, one millimeter in diameter, three flute, and it's coated. We index our work correctly and move it in. Uh, 
one thing I have to say about the Deckel FP1, it's a marvelous machine to film on. No matter if we use the horizontal or the vertical spindle. In this case we could have used the horizontal spindle too because we don't need the quill at all. It's all milling. But I'm not exactly sure why I did it with the vertical. But as you see it, it works out perfectly. And we're not doing any heavy roughing so vertical spindle is doing extremely well here. So with small end mills, I like to run them as fast as possible, obviously, so 2000 RPM it is. And I just touched off and now we're taking um, 0.1 millimeter depth increments, full slotting cuts with cutting oil. And that will remove the bulk of the material. 10% of the cutter diameter is pretty much the maximum in my experience for a reliable slotting cut with small end mills. So. 10% 10, 10 of the cutter diameter as a depth step down. So let's, let's whittle out the slot, add some cutting oil here. So you might notice that I dropped the cutter on the last pass way below what the material thickness is. So I'm using now an area of the end mill that's not compromised by the, the roughing. So that way we get a little bit more life out of the end mill. Now we step over to clean up the side walls to final width. The, this technique by dropping the cutter below the area that has been used for roughing is also very useful on CNC mills. That way you can get a lot more life out of your end mills. And since end mills are a fairly expensive cutting tool, well, we like to press as much uh, utility out of them as possible. You can see with the reflection of the air gun in the, in the sidewall of the slot that the finish is pretty darn good. Uh, cleaning the reducer sleeve. Uh, I'm just did a, put a little bit of IPA on it, um, alcohol, and blew it off just to get rid of small fine chips and dust and oil and things that collect on the surface. This is just another thing that I do to keep precision. Clean everything constantly. Wiping, compressed air, alcohol wiping. Cleanliness is probably one of the most important things that you need to learn for precision machining. No matter if you're milling, turning or grinding, cleanliness is everything. So we move over. Got our six millimeter four flute carbide end mill in here, still running at 2000 RPM. Uh, I'm going to cut a little bit of a flat on both sides, then I'm measuring over the flats with a micrometer, then I adjust to final thickness. Another feature that we need to finish is 
the dimension across those two pins. And for that we can use the same end mill, just dropped it down according to, to the dimensions that we need here and just giving a quick skim cut. Okay, that's all the milling on this part. It's a little bit, it, it's, it's quite, quite involved for such a small part, but also it's kind of a fun part to make because something like the tree panning is not super common. So here's part on the remaining stock. Now we go to the bench, do some hand blending and then we do the remaining lathe work. Now my favorite topic, bench work or um, in this case, uh, blending by hand. Uh, we need to blend this area here that's uh, ball milled a little bit to the surrounding surfaces. Not necessary for, for dimension or surface finish. This is just me being rather picky and um, uh, particular about surface finish. The, the dimension is as you can see, 6.93 on the machined lathe diameter and the, the ball milled diameter is 6.95. So we have a little bit of, of the cusp height here. To blend, we could do it with needle file. We could use uh, some emery cloth. Emery cloth wrapped around a needle file. There's a very traditional way of, of doing polishing like this. And then just working the surface like this or lengthwise depending on, on what you want to achieve. But the emery cloth is relatively slow. What I found to be extremely fast cutting are these uh, borite uh, golden star uh, abrasive stones. You get them in different grids from I think 240 up to 1200, something like that. I think we, we will be fine by using a 400 and maybe a 600 or only the 600 because we're not removing much material. Uh, these stones are relatively, they have, they are aluminum oxide, so they are not soft, but the binder that holds the grain together is fairly weak. Means uh, when you use these, they fall apart quite quickly. At first glance, that sounds like a terrible thing, but when you do blending and polishing, you want your stone to be conforming to the shape you're polishing. So the, st the stone takes the shape of the surface you're polishing and in the same uh, vein, you're polishing the surface uh, along the surface, uh, along its shape. Uh, that's a, a hard sentence. And when used dry, they break down relatively slow, but as soon as you add some kind of a liquid, most people use a thin oil or, for example, kerosene. I like to use uh, isopropyl alcohol for this because it flashes off and, and doesn't uh, leave a smeary film all over the shop. Uh, as soon as you use a liquid, the breaking down of the stone is, uh, speeds up dramatically because you create kind of a slurry out of the metal that you abrade and the stone that gets a little bit abraded the, and the slurry speeds up the, the conforming of the stone to the shape you're working on extremely fast or extremely, um, oh, well, uh, it goes faster. <laughs> so uh, I just keep the stone a little bit wetted like this uh, in, in a bottle, <laughs> I just have a piece of uh, a bottle cap here and then I just go to town. I start out 90 degree to the cusps with a 600 grit. Let's see how a 600 grit goes.
So, and on the stone node, you can see that we're already creating this radius of the part onto the stone. And this makes polishing way easier once it conforms and you're not on single point or single line contact anymore. And we're not putting on a ton of pressure. Uh, we let the abrasive do the work here. And you will also notice the moment when your uh, liquid media flashes off because it starts to cut not as nicely anymore. Okay, uh, there is a little bit of a blend line where the, the cusping of the of the mill surface doesn't match the the turn surface yet, but uh, we will get rid of that in a second. So let's do the other side, or start with the other side. I'm not going to do it all on camera because it's hard to work around the camera on on something like this. And once you get a little bit of practice, you can concentrate on the area that where you want to remove additional material, like, like I'm doing right now here at the blend between the milled and the turn surface. I'm not doing a full stroke anymore, I'm, I'm doing a rather short stroke. Uh, a mold maker would, would do something very similar. He might use a die profile filer, which is a handheld filing machine. I have one of those, but I'm not very practiced with it. I'm not very good with it. So um, I usually do something small like this just by hand. And uh, this starts to look very good. Of course, we have now the, the, the 90 degree to the uh, turned tool marks oriented uh, uh, marks from the stone but we will get rid of that too. I will do a little bit more work to it off camera and then I will come back and do a nice finishing. We did most of the blending with the stone. Uh, looks terrible right now. Time to do some go into the finish department here. So 400 grit emery cloth wrapped around the needle file like this. And going into the direction of the lathe tool marks that are surrounding our blend. And this does a very neat job of, of hiding everything that we did. Uh, I think it's called hiding your crimes. We can work all the way up to the to the pin feature that we cut. This doesn't have to be perfect for a very good reason that we will see in a second once we have this done to all all of the surfaces. There is a little bit of a burr left on on the on this side of the tree pen feature. There's a little bit of a burr. I will just needle file that. A very light cut with a needle file. And look at the motion that I do for the needle file. I push forward and then I pull the handle down. So 
this end goes upwards and that's how you file a radius. Otherwise the file does not really follow the shape of the radius. You're creating something completely odd. Uh, there is a burr. Just hit the top and do a mild edge break here. Same on this side. Uh, I really should do a deburring podcast, right? Just deburr and talk about things. I can rant forever about things. These pins have a little bit of a burr on the on the top edge. That's probably the most annoying feature to deburr a small triangular scraper uh, working its way around. Does an okay job. So to deburr those tiny pins. Well, uh, I took off the majority with the needle file, of course, but to, f to do a final, final deeper, I'm using a mounted piece of Kratex. You can purchase these from uh, mold suppliers, for example, mold making suppliers. It's a rubber with abrasive in it, mounted on a three millimeter shank. The, you, you mount them yourself, you s just thread them on. And uh, this is a very coarse silicon carbide stone that's used for dressing these. And I'm just dressing the end square and flat-ish. Then I take either a mounted conical aluminum oxide stone or a small uh, deburr tool or a diamond ball engraver and I put a dimple in the face of this piece of Kratex. Just like this, a very minor dimple. And this dimple very conveniently fits over our pin feature in here. And by, by doing this motion, we will uh, put a nice edge break on it, polish the face and a little bit of the side of this feature, and it will just come out very nicely. Ugh. And since it cuts relatively slow, even if you have a slip off, the consequences are small. So next we need a small scotch bread wheel. For that we cut off a piece of maroon scotch bread. Uh, have scissors that you use only for abrasive because cutting abrasives uh, is deadly to them. And we take this piece of, of scotch bread and we punk, punch a hole into it, uh, kind of in the center. Put uh, the screw of one of these uh, three millimeter tool shanks through. If, you want to, if we want to do a spectacular job, we can even snip off the corners. Or you can use a hole punch to make, make a, a round uh, wheel, but these wear so fast, so I don't really put much work into them. The nice thing about them is they cost close to nothing. So this spins uh, rather violently. I wouldn't go above, uh, this is 11,000 RPM. And with this, we have a very nice tool now. This is gold. So that's the blend with the scotch bright wheel after stoning and some uh, polishing. So that's what I put into a part to make it a high quality looking product. Could have left the cusping from the ball end mill, but I didn't want to. I wanted to 
have it look like an industrial item. Uh, back on the lathe, put the waste stock in the spindle, uh, touching off on the end of the part carefully with the parting blade, zeroing the DRO, moving over with the uh, width of the parting blade in consider consideration and parting it off about 0.5 millimeter oversize in length. There we go. There is our part. So I have these cutoffs uh, remaining from, from making this batch of parts. Uh, what do you do with them? Throw them away? Yeah, it's 12mm diameter stainless steel, about 25mm length. I can make a ton of parts out of these chunks here. Uh, well, paying parts, that is. As long as I know what it is. So what we're doing? So that's five seconds of hand engraving. And now I know what this piece of scrap is. Doing it with all five. While I show a lot of parts being made, I think it's also important to show when things go wrong, very wrong or terrible wrong. This is a case of between very wrong and terrible wrong. Uh, nobody died, so that's a good thing. Um, as you can see, I have I have ten of these parts rolled up uh, uh, rolled up here. Apart from these two that need backside finishing still, but that's a different thing. And I also have a box here with uh, two, four, six, with ten parts that are finished on one side and not on the back side. Why that? Twenty parts. Um, the order is ten parts. Well, I made a mistake, and. A rather annoying mistake. So I have this cutaway piece here to show you the error or the mistake I made. This 60 degree countersink in here on these 10 parts is too deep. So the diameter is too large. And why did that happen? Well, that's I can I can sketch you sketch it out for you. We had we had a, a 60 degree countersink like this. And so, and it was dimensioned here, diameter four. Large end of this countersink, of the 60 degree countersink, was dimensioned with diameter four. Since, oh, uh, we need cross hatching here too, and a center line, because we're civilized people here. So, this diameter four doesn't help me anything when I do the machining. I need this dimension here, X. So I can come in with my form tool, in my case a center drill, because it has a nice 60 degree taper angle. Touch off here on this edge, or on, on this edge, with my 60 degree tool, and then plunge in dimension x. Stupid me did the math on paper and didn't double check it. I just went with it like a complete idiot. Made all 10 parts. Then I was thinking, hey, I never checked that depth of the of the 60 degree um, countersink. So I went into CAD. Uh, put in a 4mm ball, did my ball dimensioning for it, and well, I was about 0.3mm too deep. That That's an awful lot here on the diameter. So that's a problem. So these parts are all scrap. Scrapped basically uh, a lot of work. So mistakes happen. Uh, gladly I still had 
a stick of this material around so I was still up and running. I, I had the machine set up, I had all the tooling still in the lathe holders, the quick chains holders and within one and a half days I'm back in operation and I have the parts almost done by now. Uh, I'm glad I catched the mistake and didn't deliver these parts. That would that would be uh, worse. But this way, I'm still in uh, in schedule. I have now parts that are absolutely with intolerance, and everything is good now. But errors happen; they happen very quickly. And when you do math yourself on paper double check it. Make sure you're right. Don't uh, assume anything. Always double check. Uh, this mistake, this mistake really hurt me. Um, not only my pride as a wannabe machinist, but also uh, from a business standpoint, from a time standpoint. Um, this, this eats quite a bit of time. I was thinking that that this should be in the video and should be shown that things like that can happen and will happen if you do machining. And it's painful, but it's part, it's part of the story. So, Okay, backside machining. We start just by putting these pieces back in the spindle and take a very light facing cut to get rid of the rather rough surface from the parting tool. So now we can take the part and we can check the overall length with a micrometer. So we have to remove 0.4 millimeters and a little bit. So part goes back in way deeper than it would need for general machining. But now we, we take off the remaining stock. This DCMT insert is truly awful at facing, but since we're removing only a le very little material, well, I'm just going with it. I'm taking it out, I'm checking the dimension, and then I will put it in a way into the chuck so I can do all my end machining. It needs a lot of overhang here. Over here on the surface plate, checking the height or the length of the part before we continue with the TESA height gauge. Should be 20 millimeters, that's, that's gonna do it. Also, I'm going to probe the top of the part as my reference. Then I'm going to drop the ball down into the 60 degree countersink in here that I showed you in the cross-section. Uh, giving a little bit of preload on the probe, spinning the part on the, on the ruby ball to seat it properly. Then I take a measurement. And this is my, my top to ball dimension for the countersink. And that's within 30 microns here. That's good. That's good. So to do my end machining, I need about six to seven millimeters of overhang. Means I'm on the last serration of these hard jaws. And also I'm I'm holding partially on the wrench flat that we machined onto this part. So this is on a scale of one to ideal, this is a 0.01. Uh, this is terrible, to be honest, but I make it work because sometimes uh, just indicating a part in is the easiest thing to do and not creating a super complex fixture. So let's see how it's... Okay, that's terrible. 
that's uh, <laughs> that's not good. So, okay, there we go. That's better. I'm just wiggling and uh, tightening the chuck at the same time. Okay, that's better. Uh, now get an indicator in. And this is a little bit of back and forth now. I start out here checking my, my run out. Well, let's move the camera so you see what I'm doing. So you see that we have a terrible run out out here about uh, 0.15 millimeters and in here it's a little bit less. So we go out here and we find our high spot. We take a small copper drift and slightly to the side of the probe tip we knock the part down and we try to match the run out in the first position over here. Okay, that's pretty close. So, and now we can use the, now, now the part is kind of parallel in the chuck. Now we can use our fine adjust screws on this chuck to, to get it overall running true, true to the center of rotation. Okay, that's close. Yeah, that was the wrong screw. Very good. Uh, trained expert here. Okay, 20 micron. Okay, that's within 10. Now we move to the outside again. And we have a little wobble here, 20, 20 micron in overall. So we try to knock it down 10. Like this. Oh, we have a little bit 10 and a little bit here. And we have uh, 10 and a little bit here. So we, we find the low spot. I'm always looking for the low spot when using the adjust on the chuck. And I'm lifting the chuck up by tightening the screw. And the way I do it, I tighten the screw, move the chuck. The chuck moves against the mounting screws. It slides despite being fully tightened down. Not a problem. There is molybdenum disulfide grease between the back plate and the chuck. Uh, that's a recommendation by Robin Rancetti and it works marvelous. And once I did the adjustment I backed the screw off. Just quarter turn. Uh, so when I use the screw on the opposite side I'm not fighting this one. Okay, that's very good. And well, that's one of the things that's easier without a camera. Okay, now we now we tighten down. I haven't tightened down the chuck fully yet, so I give my final uh, um, torque on the on the scroll. Click. Uh, since I'm a human torque wrench. Okay, uh, that of course threw the part off center a little bit again. Okay, there we go. Zero run out here with this indicator and about 10 microns out here. Yeah, that's 10. 10 and a little bit. That's perfectly fine for this. Uh, this is not a fast spinning item later. So one might say this is fairly slow what I did or very cumbersome and I would say no it's not. It's relatively quick if you try not to do it for the camera and work around the camera and make it kind of visible. Usually this takes less than two, three minutes and yeah I could also bore soft jaws for example or an emergency call it. But emergency collets cost money, soft jaws are work, more work, and they are not always that reliable on small parts like this. 
And also, this is good practice to get fast red indicating. Uh, if you barely indicate parts in, you will be super slow doing part indicating. I'm relatively quick indicating because I do it all the time. Okay, now we're holding on the, on the part really on like uh, maybe four millimeters. And now we can do our OD turning and threading. If you wonder what the holes in the jaws are for, I can put in dowel pins and clamp with the pins a ring and then bore the hard jaws of this chuck in the proper preloaded way. Uh, that's a different way of doing it. Robin Rancetti showed recently an excellent view with a undercut in the jaws, which is uh, not for the faint of heart to do. Uh, uh, face grooving into a hardened chuck jaw with a CBN tool is really uh, not trivial. Uh, this is a a little bit more approachable and if I remember correctly he also showed this method with the pin holes in the jaws. So that's another way of doing it. But back to machining this part. Touched off on the end, zeroed out the DRO as usual. And now we rough down the diameter to 8 millimeters for a fine thread. Okay, uh, let's cut the thread relief. We do, we're doing this with the DCMT insert here. This will give a nice thread relief. There we go, that's the thread relief. A nice thread of course needs a nice chamfer. I was asked two things about threading. Why, when I'm, when I'm threading very close to the jaws uh, why, or doing internal threads against a hard shoulder, why don't I run the lathe in reverse and use a overhead tool? Well, that's an excellent technique if you, if you want to do it that way. I don't do it because I'm, I'm running relatively slow. That's maybe uh, 150 RPM. Also, I'm leaving the half nuts closed. Um, I know that if the pitch of the thread can be divided, uh, or other way, if the pitch of the lead screw can be divided evenly through the pitch of the thread you're cutting on a metric machine, you can always open the, the, the half nut and engage it wherever you want and you will always hit your thread pitch again. Um, but again, I'm used to thread this way and uh, threading is a high risk operation anyways and I'm doing it the way that I'm the most confident and that's the reason why the half nut stays closed.
That was my spring pass. And from experience on the previous parts, this should be very close already. Uh, just getting rid of the cutting oil a little bit. They don't goop up the, the thread gauge with it. There we go. <laughs> uh, first try. Uh, yeah, that's um, very subjective, but uh, there is. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, that's the beauty of a full profile threading insert. It cuts the root and the crest of the thread and it's just a nice thread here. So opening the half nut, uh, disengaging the feed gear train of the machine because it's noisy. And it adds some mechanical noise to the machine when you do fine machining. So hey, that, we, we already had that chamfer tool. Yeah, I'm re-chamfering the thread start because the, the threading insert pulls usually a little bit of a burr over in where we chamfered. So let's get rid of that. There we go. That's just for cleanliness. Uh, this, back, this back edge here needs a chamfer. It's close. But we can do it without hitting the jaws. I always like to do a idiot check by hand spinning the chuck before I turn the machine on, just in case. There we go. There is our chamfer, very cleanly. Uh, that's the beauty of, of these solid carbide tools that I use a lot. They are very sharp or can be very sharp and leave usually very little burr. So last thing to do is to bore this side to a larger diameter. Uh, another small carbide boring bar. This is a little bit tricky because we have a 2.6 millimeter hole and a boring bar that barely fits in and a fairly deep hole. So we were going to retract the tool at least twice to get the chips out. We start by opening the hole up from 2.6 to 3 millimeters in the first pass and then we sew on. But first we need to touch off on the face. Uh, with such a small tool I prefer usually to run the spindle and touch off just by scratching. On this first pass we had the lucky situation that the chip coiled itself up in a way that it exited straight through the through bore and the part through the other side. Now we open it up to 3.2. The hole diameter needs to be 3.3 .3 minus 50 micron. And here you can see the chips we're producing. Very fine cut chips. Finish the boring and to inspect the bore I have two gauge pins upper diameter which is 3.3 .3 nominal that's the drawing diameter and it's tolerance in the drawing with minus 50 microns so I also have a 3.25 millimeter pin here this is the smaller one this fits and has a little bit of wiggle so nice nice and light fit it's really not a 
obtrused by anything. It's just sliding in. And the larger one, 3.3, doesn't fit. So we are between the lowest and the highest possible dimension between the extremes. Perfectly fine. And that's the reason why I like gauge pins so much. This is truly the most... A, a gauge pin gives the best confidence, in my opinion, on, on, on a hole. Uh, it also tells you something about if a hole is tapered to the bottom, because you, you can feel it getting tighter to the bottom. So gauge pins are, are the best. No matter if you have purchased gauge pins or you turn your own pins as necessary. Tiny chamfer tool. There we go. That's one part finished. So here we are with the parts of the lathe and some minor final deburring done. All that was left to be deburred was the end of the thread. I just hit the start of the thread very carefully with a die grinder with a Kratex wheel just to knock that little bit of a high spot burr off. And then the parts were done. Ultrasonic cleaning and off to shipping. I hope you enjoyed this fairly interesting small part. At least I hope it was interesting. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.